and we're playing someone from Azerbaijan. Very nice. Fuad. All right. Queen's Gambit. I want to mix it up just a little bit. And I want to introduce you guys to a cool line in the Queen's Gambit called the Chigorin system. So far, we've been playing exclusively QGD. I feel like mixing it up a little bit. Let's play Knight C6, which is called the Chigorin. I'll talk more about the origins of this system after the game. But essentially, the Zen behind Knight C6 is very, very simple. Everything you do for the next five moves is going to be geared toward attacking the d4 pawn. Now, you might be thinking about this and scratching your proverbial beard and saying, okay, well, how, how do we attack this pawn? Like, do we take on c4 here? Well, that doesn't look good because it allows d5. Ugh. But remember that it, attacking can mean two things. It can mean direct pressure or it can mean indirect pressure. You can be attacking or pressuring things that defend whatever it is you're trying to attack ultimately. Am I explaining this clearly? So in this case, it's the knight or the queen. Well, e5 gives up a pawn. e5, d takes e5, guys. Bishop g4, very good. Bishop g4, you want to take the knight, ruin white's pawn structure, and weaken the d4 pawn. Now, there isn't necessarily any rush with bishop takes f3. And uh, if I don't remember the theory here. I think it might be e6 first. But for the sake of illustration, I'm going to take on f3 and just show you guys what happens when you okay so e takes f3 is already kind of inaccurate here but it's important to navigate this accurately with black now i know a lot of you are tempted by dc thinking oh after bishop c4 i win the pawn but there's a flaw in that reasoning after d takes c4 i've already pointed this out do not forget that you've allowed what nasty move yeah the correct move here is either e6 or knight f6 yeah d5 d takes e4 d5 and if the knight slides over to e5 then white can keep tossing that knight around alakine style with f4 bishop f4 so we play this solidly with e6 defending the pawn and as you'll notice white will be left very soon with a very big weakness on d4 okay bishop f4 now another thing you have to do is obviously reassess stuff that was impossible on the previous move very common source of blunders and mistakes is, okay, a move is impossible, so you're going to push it out of your mind. And that's what you guys are doing. You guys are reacting to what you think is the threat of knight b5, but that's not a threat. Some of you are playing a6, but first thing to establish, folks, is that knight b5 is not a threat. It can be defended in a variety of ways. One of them is rook c8. Now we play d takes c4 because d5 is no longer a a, a problem due to e takes d5 thank you for a player chess and now white is in trouble and he loses a pawn there we go now what should we take it with well that's not a trivial question because both pieces can capture but in the interest of playing like a good russian schoolboy we would play queen takes d4 yeah in the interest of playing like a good russian schoolboy we would force the queen trade why are we forcing the queen trade because both bishops are hanging in addition to the queen trade being offered. Now, we're not out of the woods, folks, because we haven't developed our king side. We need to play very carefully here and to make sure we're not allowing any nasty stuff with knight b5. Castle short, okay. And we need to prioritize, right? You have a situation like this. The top priority is to get our king to safety. Yeah, Kavita, we were threatening a fork on c2. That's why he castled. Well, bishop takes c7 is a threat. We need to defend against it. But you don't just want to go rook c8. If you're already defending against it, then you might as well accomplish some other stuff, right? So we long castle. And this should not be a surprising move to anybody. We make our king safer, and we defend c7. What more can you ask of a move? There was a reason I didn't like bishop d6, by the way, which was an alternative. Now we have a chance to simplify the position, which will buy us more time to complete our development. Who sees what I'm talking about? We can simplify, force a trade, give us another tempo. Knight c2. Knight c2, we take his bishop, eliminate the two bishop advantage, which is the only source of white's compensation, create a weakness on e3, and then purposefully attack this weakness. With what move? Here, simplification makes a lot of sense. Bishop c5, very good. Now, think about where the knight belongs, and don't just 
say f6 because that's where you usually develop it. Actually think about where you want this knight to be and what you want it to do. In the end game, every piece must be doing something. You cannot afford uh, to mishandle one of your minor pieces. Well, let's answer the second question first. What do we want the knight to be doing? Well, presumably we want it to be attacking this weakness on e3. And so we can go either knight h6 or, more to the point, is knight e7. Knight h6, some people like to be fancy, but the problem with knight h6 is that if white plays g4, your knight's going to be shut down. You understand what I'm saying? Here, if white plays g4, at least the knight has other routes it could take. It's like if you're booking a flight, you can book at the Frankfurt airport, or you can book it through, I don't know, some remote place in Newfoundland, Canada, with one flight a week. It's like, you got to prepare for your flight being canceled. Okay, what now? Has, has our opponent, has he taken the sting out of knight f5? Has he taken the sting out of it? No, he has not. He has not. Even though it may seem like he has, because white has e4 now. That's his idea, I assume. But now you ask yourself, well, what's the drawback of e4? Okay, well, maybe it weakens some squares. What square does it weaken? Well, it weakens d4. Let's put our knight there. That's an outpost. All right, we could have played knight e3, but remember, that knight could have gotten trapped there. I don't like moves like knight e3, which, which look good on the surface, but if you look a little bit closer, you see that the knight on e3 is stranded. We have to be patient here. This, these end games are not won in five moves or even in ten moves. We need to keep making improving moves slowly but surely. Rook d1. He's playing well, by the way. Okay. Now we need to address a couple of other issues in our position, which are annoying me. The first of which is the prospect that something bad is going to happen down the C-file. You guys are on the ball. Let's go C6. Let's create a little pawn chain so that any time in the field. Okay, knight a4, not dangerous at all. Where should our bishop go? In fact, our bishop has multiple squares it could hop to. No, not b5, because the bishop is hanging. Bishop b7, yeah, bishop b7. We could go bishop b6 and offer the trade, but why? Bishop b7 is perfectly good enough. Now we're threatening b5. Now, as our opponent is thinking, we are actively figuring out ways that we can further improve our position. Who can name a plan or a short operation that can allow you to further improve your pieces or your position? Just name some moves, and we'll make one of those moves. Double rooks, excellent. You guys are thinking the right way. How about this bishop? Where could it go? Maybe it could go to f6, right? It can go onto a better diagonal where it could support the knight. But probably the most uh, flexible is to start by doubling rooks, and then we'll see. So some of you said e5. Technically, e5 has a drawback, but I'll talk about that after the game. So e5 drawback. Obviously, here we want to double, especially because it defends the knight. Again, we're threatening b5. Notice that. And it's missed. That's it. Good. Just double check. Rook takes c6. Knight takes c6. Nothing. Okay. Boom. Easy. We kept our eyes open for tactics. Now, notice what I did there. On the one hand, I was kind of playing the long game. Okay. Here's how we improve our position. Blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, I, I kept my eyes peeled. By the way, king b7 wins the game. Rook is hanging. Knight is hanging. And he can't take on b5 because of back rank mate. But on the other hand, I was keeping my eyes peeled for tactical ideas. Which piece should we take? Bishop, should we take the knight? No, obviously not, because then the rook takes. We should take the rook. Goodbye. Rook takes d7, then we infiltrate, take all the pawns. Actually, rook d1 is even better, because we win the bishop. Why do we win the bishop? What is the final move after king g1? Spam it. Bishop c5, yeah. Dark squares. There we go. We're over 16. We're actually exactly 1600. Very, very good. So the Chigorin is one of those systems that flies under the radar. I have one student who plays it. It's very dubious if white plays accurately, but it's not a bad... I mean, it's like the Baltic, you know, or it's like the Albin. It's one of those types of openings. C5 here. I would call them like third tier or even maybe second tier defenses but at this level it's not a bad idea to to learn something like this and to have it 
as a secondary opening. So Chagorin defense was named after Mikhail Chagorin. It was really the first very famous player to come out of Russia. He lived from 1850 to 1908 and uh, tremendous contribution to opening theory in many different openings. The guy was amazing. He started the first journal, chess journal in Russia um, called Chess List. Um, let me see if I can maybe find like an inaugural edition of it and read, read from it. Yeah, so you can see, by the way, this is interesting. You can see, by the way, that the notation, this is the 1870s, and the notation is already modern. Look at, look at the notation. This is the first edition of Chess List. Um, games. Match Potter against Tukertort, French defense, 20 no November 1875. E4, E6, D4, D5. We can read some of his annotations. So this is Chagorin's annotations. Like he would analyze tons of new games. Nobody had this in Russia at the time. Here also possible is Knight C3. So you can see how much, how much analysis there is. The guy was serious. Studies, scotch game. All of this he did himself on his own. Yeah, look at how much analysis there is. And modern notation. Black takes three pieces for the queen, but in his cramped situation, must lose. Anyways, back to the game. But Chagorin was kind of an OG. He analyzed a lot of openings. He read a lot of opening articles, and among them was the Chagorin queen's gambit. Yeah. Okay, so I won't delve into the theory. In modern times, it's considered that knight c... I think knight c3 is supposed to give the biggest advantage. d c d5. So this idea basically kills the, kills the fawn in the Chagorin. But after knight f3, bishop g4, you get a very fun line. So if c takes d5, this is the one thing I will show you guys. You don't play queen takes d5 because of knight c3. This is s-h-i-t, <laughs> d5, etc. What do you do here? Who can tell me? What do you do? Bishop takes knight. If d takes c6, you take that pawn with your bishop and you're fine. And if g takes f3, then you play queen takes d5, attacking d4, forcing white to spend a tempo to defend it. And the main line goes e5, knight c3, bishop b4. And then you get this fascinating position where white has two bishops, black has two knights, but white is this in insane pawn structure, black castles queen side. Black is worse in this main line, but it's really, really interesting. So you guys are welcome to explore this on YouTube on your own. Make an analysis board. Use Opening Explorer. Um, and that's just like a plea to people who are like, well, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know how to learn this opening. Well, first of all, you want to do a YouTube search. But if there's no material, just create an analysis board on chess.com. Use Opening Explorer and just like figure out, you know, what the theory is and try to understand it. So here, after bishop f3, yeah, ef is the main move, actually. Okay, so where our opponent went wrong is in playing bishop f4 here. This is a bad move. Um, apparently, white is supposed to play c, d, e, d, and now bishop b5, which makes sense. This is a lot more aggressive, and you're threatening to remove the knight, which is the main attacker of d4. And white is slightly better here as well. But once bishop f4 happened, we play dc. A lot of you were scared of this. It's not scary for many reasons. Could somebody name one of them other than rook c8? Uh, rook c8 is not what we would have played. What would we have played here? Bishop b4 check, very good. Because knight, knight b5 exposes this diagonal. Ziptif, thank you for the sub. If king e2, we can always just play bishop a5 and use the bishop to defend the pawn. Yeah, we can play bishop d6, absolutely, but that's not the best move. I mean, would you rather keep the pawn and force the king onto e2 or allow white to win the pawn back like this? No, the move is bishop b4 check. By the way, the same idea happens in the Jabawa London, which I play. Knight c3, bishop f4. There is a line where white plays knight b5, and here black has knight a6, but one of the most viable systems is bishop b4, bishop a5. Just remember this concept. Okay, so once we take the pawn, white is worse. I mean, here white is just down a pawn. And 
Our opponent could have improved at several moments. Bishop e3 is really bad. Um, probably white should play something like rook ad1. When white has certain compensation for the pawn, I mean, white has two bishops, active position, we would have to be careful. Probably we would get our knight out. You know, and the game goes on. Rook fe1 and a bishop e5, something like this. I'm not too interested in analyzing this endgame. I just think black is better, but white has something for the pawn. Bishop e3 allows this simplification. Now there's no longer any compensation. In fact, white is the one suffering on top of being down a pawn. Why was his undoubling his pawns worth the tempo? Wait, what do you... Oh, why did we spend the tempo to undouble his pawns? Like, why did we do this? Oh, because, as I often say, doubled pawns is not how you should think of this. His pawn structure on the king side right now is a lot safer than this, because white has a very clear weakness on e3 now. Also, we remove a very important piece. The, the light squared bishop is sort of overseeing the board. Does that make sense? So by removing it, we are leaving him with his other bishop, which is, eh, staring at, at biting on granite. And the rest was pretty easy. I mean, white could have defended much more resiliently. But, okay, here he blundered. But we would go rook d8. We would start pushing our king side pawns. I mean, this is just terrible for white. Was knight e3 followed by rook d2 good? Maybe. So I didn't play knight e3 because I didn't want the knight trapped. So there's a question about this. Oh, white is a beautiful move here. No, it's not good. And white is a beautiful refutation. What do you have to notice here? It's Chigorin. You got it except I instead of A. Look at this. Notice this x-ray. Okay. Knight b1. Amazing. Knight b1. Knight b1 and black is busted. You can't, you can't hold all of your pieces at once. Like you can try bishop b4, which is kind of funny, but it doesn't work. Does that make sense? Bishop b4... You would not do this. No, no, no. You would play rook takes knight. One second. Here we go. Perfect example. Look at this 2100 outplaying a GM and then blundering exactly in this way. Watch. So this is Dragon Kosic, Grandmaster from, I think, Montenegro. Playing a tournament in 2005. Look at this position. Look at how this 2100 has outplayed the GM in 18 moves. Just look at this. But what does he do? The guy says, Margetta says, oh, okay, let me take the bishop and let me infiltrate the second rank. How good does this look? This looks winning for black. But what did he miss? What did he miss? He forgot to look for the x-ray. Knight b1. Bingo. That's it. I mean, you have to give up the exchange. And he lost. Right, so these ideas are important. X-rays, night retreats, that stuff. 